We're so blessed and encouraged by the guests we have in our midst this morning. We are so thankful for you being here, thankful for your presence, and we hope that you'll be able to come back again and worship with us and visit with us again. We're so thankful for the good turnout we had last night at our Candy Carnival. Thankful for the participation. We had a great number present. And by estimated counts, we had about five to six families that weren't associated with the congregation at all that did come through and take part. A couple of the families took part of uh, maybe the trunk or treat and then the cake walk and a couple others did some other things, but we had visitors. And so that's wonderful for us to have those come our way. We're thankful for all the members that participated and did trunks and brought candy. You know, as you look around, a lot of our Young people are really sugared up still this morning, and even some of the adults, I think. So a lot of candy this time of year, a lot of good stuff, good times, and we're thankful that we can all share in those things. This morning we want to consider in our time together pure and undefiled religion. If you'd like to turn to James chapter 1, we'll be looking at some verses there that talk just about that and that get pretty specific regarding pure and undefiled religion religion. The question was raised by an individual who had come in late to service and he asked the usher, is the sermon done yet? And the usher replied to him, well, the sermon has been preached, but it has yet to be done. And I thought, you know, that could happen anywhere at any time in any gathering. But what truth is there? That's a lot of truth, isn't it? The message has been proclaimed But what about living it out? And that's where we think about pure and undefiled religion in James chapter 1. And that's the message that I think James is revealing here and God is trying to get across to us. That we are to live, if we want to live in this way, in a pure way, in an undefiled way, and practice our dedication to God, then we're going to find the key components here in James 1 about how to do just that, but it's got to be practiced. It's not something that's just in the mind. It's not something that's just in our heart somewhere, but it's going to be believed and lived out in our everyday life. So in James 1, beginning in verse 21, notice we're commanded to put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, But a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Pure and undefiled religion as identified by God. Think about real religion. It's the difference between hypocrisy and sincerity. It's more than being different than the majority. And it's not simply just a matter of faith or belief It's a matter of action, isn't it? As we read those words, beginning in verse 21 through the end of the chapter, through verse 27. James James chapter 1 here gives us three directives that we want to notice this morning that show us how we can obtain real, pure, and undefiled religion. Consider first that we are to abandon the world. Now, James and and God is not calling us here to, you know, abandon the planet, not even the people. You know, don't go away somewhere by ourselves and just try to live life. That's not the point. 
But he's saying abandon the world in the sense that abandoned, abandon the mentality, the morals, and the motives of the world and the way the world thinks. As a Christian, we're called upon to be different. We've been called out of the world and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son, Colossians chapter 1. And so as we think about that, well then we realize that the way we're to live, the values that we're to exhibit and practice, the life we're to live, is completely opposite of that of the world. We're to abandon the world and the way of the world. And that's the idea there. We're not to live like the world lives, but we're to be different. We're set apart. We've been justified and purified and sanctified as a Christian, we're a different person. We have a different life to live. And it's largely in opposition to the world. But notice James describes it in several ways. There in verse uh, 21, he said to put aside or lay aside, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. And so he begins to give us some idea about how to live. Don't live like the world. The world is in wickedness, isn't it? The world is completely entrenched in ungodliness, in sin, in darkness, in perversion. We see this all the time when we look into the world. James says, look, part of living the right way, if you want to have pure and undefiled religion, don't live like the world, but abandon the world's motives and the morals and the mentality that it's trying to push upon you. We know also, as we go down to verse 26, he says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart, and this person's religion is worthless. We're going to come back to these couple of these points in a few moments with some other application. But he says, keep your mouth under control, unlike the world. Now, the world is always spewing, you know, deceit and lies and hate and ugliness toward each other. And there's no good that comes out of the mouth of the worldly people in that sense. And that's what James is making the point here. Lay aside all this wickedness, all this immorality, all of the thinking of the world. Lay that aside. Live as God wants us to live and desires for us to live. But also with that, he says, keep your mouth under control. Well, there's another way in which we stand out as a child of God, isn't it? We're striving to live a different life, a moral life, a pure life, an undefiled life. And with that, how are people most introduced to us? Through our speech, through our language, through our mouth. And so we see, well, we're to follow Jesus in that, aren't we? We're to be kind. We're to be compassionate. We're to be caring. We're to speak words of encouragement, to build up people, not tear them down, not to be ugly, not to talk like the world. If we talk like the world, people will just pass us by. Well, that's another worldly person. But if we're speaking and talking like a child of God, that's different, isn't it? And we're also striving to live like a child of God. We're not perfect, but we're striving we're not involving ourselves in all this rampant wickedness that's in the world and taking part in all of the unfruitful works of darkness, but we're different. We're striving to abandon the world in its mentality, in its morals, and its motives. And so moral defilement and every form of morally bad behavior must be put away. And so James is calling for a spiritual house cleansing, isn't he? Go with me to Colossians chapter 3 and begin in verse 5. And notice what Paul says here. Paul's writing to a church that's already been established in Colossae. And just like he wrote to Corinth, he's reminding them of things and he's trying to work on things that no doubt he's heard or he's experienced that they need to hear. And these are Christians. He's writing to the church. Think of this letter coming to us, any of these. We're the church. And so he says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Well, what are those things, Paul? He says sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, 
covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie one to another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Isn't that powerful as we read that, even as a Christian? Think of that coming to a non-Christian, but also just to us as a child of God. It's a reminder, isn't it, that when I obeyed the gospel and I professed that I believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God and I was immersed for the remission of my sins, that that was the point that I needed to begin putting to death what is earthly, what is immoral, what is worldly, what is ungodly, what is sinful. I have began to put that away when I became a Christian. And then we read the list, and this is just as an example. Paul is throwing out some things, isn't he? That are sin, that are against God and against others as well, as we, if we would practice these things. He said, on the count of these, the wrath of God is coming. And he said, you too once walked in them when you were living in them. <clears throat> but he said, now put off all these other things. And he goes into some other sins that are within. Anger and wrath and malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Well, how do we abandon the world? We understand how we're to live and we understand things we need to put away and things we need to add, take on the new self. So if we say, well, how do I abandon the world? First, in going back to James chapter 1, we understand we do this by accepting the word. <clears throat> and so he says, put away in verse 21 all these things, all this wickedness, filthiness, ungodliness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And so the first step that I make to have pure and undefiled religion, I've got, I've got to abandon the world, its morality, its mentality, and its motives. And I'm a Christian, so I'm accepting the word. And we remember as James reminds us here, it's an implanted word, it's able to save our souls and over in Hebrews 4 and verse 12, we're reminded it's living, it's active. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Think about how powerful the Word is. And that's a, a sermon in and of itself, Hebrews 4 and verse 12, isn't it? But it reminds us I'm accepting the word. And what, what are some of the qualities of that word? Well, it's living. It's active. It's all powerful. And we have to let it do the work. We have to let it in our heart. We have to accept it, receive it. As James says, receive with meekness the implanted word and allow God and his word to do their work within us to help us change. That's part of it, isn't it? As I abandon the world and I accept the word, but I'm, I'm putting aside and putting to death the rampant wickedness and immorality and ungodliness and the worldly lifestyle and the worldly mindset. And so God is helping me. He's directing us. Here's how you do that. You first, you accept the word. Let it into your heart. Let it into your mind. And the power is in the word. The Word of God is alive. In Luke 8 and verse 11, we're reminded that the seed is the Word of God. Think about the seed being the source of life, isn't it? And then God has reminded us through His Word that that seed then needs watered. It needs nurtured. It needs cared for. And so when that happens, the seed will do the work. God will do the work. The Word will do the work. It's living. It's active. And as the writer stated there, it's sharper than any two-edged sword and it will pierce to the innermost. That's the uniqueness of the Word of God, isn't it? 
In John 5 and verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, who Jesus said, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Notice, he, we hear his word. That's that implanted word. We hear it. We believe him. We believe God. We believe Jesus. We believe the word of God because it's the word from God, breathed out by God for our benefit, for our knowledge base, for our teaching. And so the word of God brings life. How blessed we are. But we begin by accepting the word in order to abandon the world. The word is a better message than the world's. We all agree with that. We all know that. And so shouldn't we spend more time in the Word of God than we do the words of man and the words of the world? The Word of God is clean, it's righteous, it's honest. It brings unity. Think about that. It doesn't bring division. It brings purity, not violation. It brings compassion and not hostility. Think about so many blessings. We could go on and on for a long time citing the benefits of the Word of God. But in order to abandon the world and be who God wants us to be, we accept the Word. We allow it in. And we know it's going to bring unity and purity and help us be compassionate people. Also with that, to abandon the world, we activate the Word. So we go back to the book of James. And there in verse 22, as we pick up, we've put away all wickedness and filthiness, worldliness. We've received with meekness the implanted word. And then verse 22, he says, be, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, and he brings up the mirror illustration. He is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And so we want to activate the word. And the idea here is simply, don't just know it, do it. Now it's important for us, we have to have, as we mentioned, that knowledge base. We have to have a foundation of the Word of God, and we always live with the Word. That's the only way we're going to develop our faith. That's the only way we're going to grow in our faith, is to have the Word within. And so we have to read it and study it and allow it to take root within. But that's not enough. Just sitting around and, th and saying, well, Lord, you know, I have a great knowledge of the Bible, or I know so much, I know so many facts, and I can recite this list and that list, God says, that's not enough. That's not the full picture. That's a piece. We have to have knowledge. We have to understand, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to live, to be pleasing to God every day? What must I do, and how must I live to go to heaven? But that's part of it, isn't it? Okay, so we have the knowledge, and we gain that. But he says, be a doer. Do it. Practice it. Isn't that a problem we find sometimes in, in members who've been members maybe a long time and they, they start drifting and they start slipping back into the world and they, start, they stop coming and they stop being involved and they no longer really pray or study or serve and or worship? What's happened? They stop doing. There's knowledge in there, but they've stopped doing. They've stopped practicing. And so we see the, the, how easy it is to get into that mind. And look at how James goes over and over with the, the most basic thought, isn't it? Be doers of the word and not hearers only. And he adds to that, deceiving yourselves. And then as we know, as we look into the mirror and we find, well, here's what I need to change. Here's what I need to fix. We don't just walk away and forget about that without taking care of it. He says, be a doer. Take care of it. Correct what you see needs correcting and changed and fixed. But be a doer of the word. Anything less is deceitful. And so God's given us a practical religion, hasn't he? We know that extending our heart to God in worship is essential. It's important, as we know. 
But what about as we go on down in the chapter to see that also God calls upon us to extend our hands and our service to our fellow human beings. And so as he goes down into verse 27, he reminds us regarding religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted or unstained from the world. In the writings of Paul, for example, in Galatians 6 and verse 10, the Bible reminds us on this point, a practical religion. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so we're to do good, aren't we? We're to follow the example of Jesus, example of the early church. They were active. They were busy in serving others. Why? To open doors, to draw attention to the church that we're an organization that is to do good. Why do you do good? Because we love God. God loves us. We want to share this love. We want you to know about your soul and the place of your soul and how you can take care of your soul eternally. We do good to open those doors. In Titus 2 and verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Isn't that interesting that that's a description of us? Well, I'm a Christian, yes. I'm to worship God, yes. I'm to live a certain way, yes. But also, how often do we think about, am I a person, are we a people, zealous of good works? That's a question for us, isn't it? I may have all these other things in line from my name to every service I attend to all the ways I try to live my life. But am I zealous for good works? Am I striving to do good unto all as I have opportunity? In Titus 3 and verse 8, this saying is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. And then in Titus 3 and verse 14, And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. It's important that as we study and understand who we are and what we're about, that it's not enough to just wear the name Christian. It's not just enough to worship God in spirit and in truth. It's not just enough to strive to live a life of Christian living. But this is a part of our characteristic, is it not? Our identity as a congregation, as a people that are involved and notice three times there in Titus and once in Galatians, and that's just starting, of where we're told to do good works. Practice good works. Be zealous for good works. Be on fire for them. In Hebrews 13 and verse 16, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And then finally on that point, 1 John 3, 17 and 18 John said, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Doesn't that come back to what James is saying exactly in chapter 1? Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Don't just talk about it. Don't just mention it, but do it. Practice it. Be a doer of the Word. Activate the Word in our life. And so as a Christian, we look into the mirror, we see the flaw, we go and fix the problem. We've got to be careful that we don't just look and then we forget what our duty is, what our responsibility is, what our true work is in the kingdom of God. 
And as we think about this, what about some specific examples? As we follow back up there in chapter 1, we mentioned about the tongue and then also helping the, those that are less fortunate and especially helping the orphans and the widows. But think about the tongue, as we mentioned. Self-control, the tongue. And, and James reminds us, he says, you know, if you don't take care of this, your religion is worthless. If we don't bridle our tongue, if we're not practicing self-control, then how devastating is that to know then, well, then everything else I do is worthless because I've given it up through immoral talk or idle talk or gossip or, you know, if, if I'm known to just come and, and I complain and I complain about the elders, and I complain about the works of the church, and I complain about this event and that event, and I complain about this brother or this sister. Our religion is worthless. Think about that. If I'm engaged in immoral talk, filthy talk, stories of the world. And so we're making application, aren't we? Thinking about application, having self-control, Plus, think about that with those things we just mentioned. We're not to be complainers. We're not to be grumblers. But we're to encourage, we're to build up the church and not tear down. Proverbs 29 and verse 20, Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. In Proverbs 17, 27 and 28, Whoever restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. We get the point, don't we? And then as the psalmist stated in Psalm 141.3, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And then we transition. The second application that James made was not only our tongue, but he said, Okay, we need to visit. The idea there is to fulfill a specific need. There's a need. Acts 6, we talk about, we could study about the widows and how the apostles appointed those that needed to be put over those works of taking care of filling those needs. There were specific things needed. And so the idea is not just a mere social visit, but it's, it's a, a visit for a purpose, and that may be needed. But can I fill a need? Can I bring a service in some way to help them along in their day or their week or their life? In Exodus 22, verse 22, beginning, stated under the Old Covenant, You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. The takeaway there is look at how strong God was in his protection of the orphans and the widows and the less fortunate and the needy as well. God being very protective, very watchful over how they are cared for and if they are cared for. Are we caring for orphans and widows, the less fortunate among us as well, in the way that God would want us to? What actions are we demonstrating that we care the way that God cares? And so as we think about pure religion and undefiled before God, you know, these aren't the only things, are they? But the real point James is making is that our religion needs to be active. And there's a whole list of things we could add to what he added or what he said in verse 27. Because God has so many things of, of how he wants us to live through his word and, and practice things as a Christian and show the love of Christ and show the example of Christ. And here's who God is. God wants us to practice that, doesn't he? He doesn't want us to sit idly by. He doesn't want us to sit on the bench. He doesn't want us to have that kind of mentality. But he wants us to be active. He doesn't want us to have the mentality, well, let some other brother or sister do that. No, he wants us to be involved, be doers of the word. What about the statement, the application that Jesus made in the Good Samaritan when he summarized everything? The one who was compassionate was the star there. 
And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Like the one who had compassion on the one who was needing help and service. What kind of religion do we have? What kind of religion are we practicing? Someone has put it this way. Is our religion like a spare tire that we only use it in the case of an emergency? Sadly, some are like that with, with church, aren't they? Only when something happens in their life do they come back or show up. Or is it, it's been referred to as the wheelbarrow mentality or religion that they're easily upset and they must be pushed. Think about that. That's someone who's high maintenance, isn't it? Or they re refer to someone like a bus ridden only when it goes our way. Maybe that's our religion. Whatever kind of religion we have, it is of no value unless it's pleasing to God who created us. As we close this morning, is it a practicing religion? Are we truly doers? Do we go beyond, does, does our practice of our faith go beyond the walls of this building? Does it go beyond the printed pages of the Word of God? Does it go beyond a superficial hearing of the Word of God or the teaching of the Word? Is it not only practicing, but is it practical? And finally, is it pure and is it personal? As we think about these things this morning, these all affect our salvation. God certainly wants us to be doers, practicing what He has outlined in His Word. We think about our salvation and we realize that there are some things we can do in a way that we can live that makes our religion vain, our Christianity worthless. We don't want to be in that realm. But what if we find ourselves there? God's given us a plan to come back. He's given us a path that we can understand and we can see the error of our way. And we can have then that desire, I want to change my way. I want to come back to God. I want to repent of my sins. I want to go to God in prayer and, and ask for forgiveness. Knowing that He's stated, I'll forgive you. 1 John chapter 1. Can we help you with that as an erring Christian this morning? Or what if you're with us and you've never obeyed the gospel? Here's an opportunity to be, begin a brand new day for the rest of your life on earth as a Christian, as a child of God, as one who knows where their salvation is. As, they, as we go through the rest of life, we can know we are saved. Jesus has gone on to prepare a place for us in heaven, in the presence of God. I begin my Christian walk by building a, a faith through the Word of God. I repent of my sins, I confess the name of Jesus, and then I'm immersed in water for the remission of my sins. <clears throat> and when I come up out of that water, I'm a child of God. My sins are gone. The Lord has added me to His church and the only church that we read about in the Bible. He's put my name in the Lamb's book of life, in that heavenly roll book. Are you there? Can we help you this morning in your process?